Ugh, what a truly sh** deer. I have to go to moist mode. Someone please call 911. If you look at our five-star review of the 911 here, our only criticism of it is don't expect to use the rear seats. I shouldn't say this really about the website that I work for, but could not be more wrong. Watch this, right? You can use the back seats for substantial book, say the Bible of motoring journalism. And that's just one seat, right? There's a whole other seat spare behind me. And so we've established that the 911 here is eminently practical. And that's not even including the boot, the front boot, which you can get some stuff in. And there's a rear shelf too. It goes on. There are two pockets in each door and there are two holders of cups. Cup holders, if you like, including one that's retractable. Also, a substantial glove box. Ish. This is the best family car ever made. Doesn't really matter how it drives now, right? But I'll tell you anyway. Tiresome, really tiresome. It's firm, it's noisy, the steering's all heavy. I mean, you can see why people buy Range Rovers instead of these things, right? <laughs> Nothing I say here today is gonna surprise you that much. I mean, we're talking about the 911 for <laughs> sake. <laughs> there is no shape more iconic, no badges revered, and no car subject to such a slow-paced aesthetic evolution stretching back five and a half decades, which is a fancy way of saying it's looked basically the same since the 60s. Its signature drivetrain configuration, rear-engined, rear-wheel drive, hasn't changed in that time either. Albeit, today's 911 feels pretty different to earlier versions, even the more recent ones from just a couple of generations ago. Now that can be both positive and a bit negative, but we'll start with the good stuff. It probably goes without saying, but I'll say it anyways, that this remains one of the most enjoyable, the most bestest, the most engaging driving experiences you can have bar none. So this here is the Carrera 4S. Oh yeah, all the variations of the 911 theme. It is an absolute minefield. This is the eighth generation model, just went on sale this year, and there's already like nine versions of it. Ranging from your bog standard rear wheel drive Carrera for 80 grand, to 212,000 pounds worth of 911 Speedster. Mental, right? And it's only gonna get worse too. There were so many versions of the last generation one that Porsche eventually had to do a 911 for Dummies video to explain them all. No other model can compete with the Porsche 911. In this video, we will explain the different derivatives to you. So I won't go through them all, and we'll just concentrate on the one that I'm driving here, the Carrera 4S. Makes sense, right? Four-wheel drive, more powerful version of the Porsche six-cylinder engine, PDK gearbox, and to all intents and purposes, 100,000 pounds worth of 911. Which is the first thing about the new 911 that does stick in your throat a little bit. Does this feel like six figures worth of car? In fact, the very car that I'm driving now, the same car whose pictures you see accompanying pretty much every review of this car that you see on the internet, complete with the world's most embarrassing number plate, it costs 126,000 pounds. 28,000 of that, options. Now, you don't have to do that, of course. That's the nature of options, they're optional. You don't have to spend 300 quid making the seatbelt yellow, or 400 quid making the glass a bit darker, or 6,000 on ceramic composite brakes. It does come with brakes as standard. But the thing is, a lot of the stuff that you can buy does have an effect on the driving experience, and a dramatic one too, like rear wheel steering, or adaptive suspension, or a noisy exhaust. But I would avoid this here, the fire extinguisher. It looks cool and that, in that sort of, I'm pretending to be a race car driver sort of way. And if you know anybody who still smokes analog style, it's probably a really funny way of extinguishing their tab from the driver's seat. <laughs> But if you've got kids, it's an absolute nightmare, right? So hypothetically, let's say your little girl gets into the car and she notices the bright red fire extinguisher under the seat and she asks what it's for. And hypothetically you say, oh, it's because this car quite often bursts into flames. It might be that your little girl gets terrified then and never wants to get into the car again, hypothetically. So like I said, maybe avoid that. And for the record, statistically, there is very little chance that this car will actually burst into flames.
My problem with this is, in my head, the Porsche 911 is still like a 70 grand sports car. The ultimate sports car, yeah, but not a supercar. Whereas at 100 grand and above, it is slap bang in the middle of the price range of this fella, the Mercedes AMG GT, which does feel like a supercar. And it's also uncomfortably close to this thing, which arguably actually is a supercar. And I'm not gonna masticate over this, but if somebody's telling me that my PCP payment for a 911 is gonna be broadly similar to the PCP payment for an Audi R8, I know which side I'm on. But let's not lose sight of exactly how good this 911 is. Yeah, it might not have the supercar vibes of the AMG or the R8, but it is easier to live with, as we've already discussed, and it is a multi-generational dynamic juggernaut. So you give this thing four-wheel drive and it almost completely overcomes any problems that you may have associated with sticking the engine over the rear axle. You see in a more sexist time, they used to call the 911 the Widowmaker. And that's because it gives you this inherently odd weight distribution. So it's fine in a straight line, right? You accelerate, the car does that. You've got all this weight on the back, pushing the car down. It gives you loads of grip, no problem. But when you lift off the throttle after accelerating, especially if you've been accelerating hard, what you're doing is you're transferring weight from the back of the car, the front. So momentarily, the back has a little bit less grip. The problem is if you're turning, if you've got any sort of steering lock on when you do that, then the weight of the back can act like a massive pendulum and just sort of swing the back end of the car out. And that's why old 911s were notorious for spinning around and ending up facing the wrong way. Now, as the generations of this car have progressed, that tendency has become weaker and weaker. They've engineered it out in various ways. And we're at the point now where the placement of the engine makes little to no difference, really, most of the time anyway. And especially in a four wheel drive version like this, because you've got power going to both the axles, you're not just driving the rear wheels. So the result is that this is a car now that you can really take liberties with in a way that you absolutely couldn't with 911's past. And that is a bit of a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, it's keener to change direction than the Liberal Democrat manifesto. Politics. An inch turned here seems to be a mile turned down there at the wheels. Just super sharp and satisfying. On the other hand, it has lost a lot of the rear-engined, rear-drive character that the 911 had and that it was famous for and that made it unique. I remember the first 911 I ever drove. It was a 996 a few years ago. And my main takeaway from that was just how different it felt to everything else. It felt almost light at the front end. You could feel the weight at the back and it was something that you had to learn. You had to get to know it. But when you did, that unique rear-biased balance was so rewarding it was such a fun thing to get a grips with the way that it turned in and the way that it felt going over the road just felt like a different animal now don't misunderstand me right this is brilliant in every which way like if you turned all the driving aids off of which there are many you will definitely begin to understand quickly exactly where the engine is and how powerful it is and just generally how much deference you have to pay to a car like this it's just that it's a little more docile now generally still massive fun and a massive amount of feel even in the wet like this but just a bit tamer you can... <laughs> despite what i just said it is actually very easy to get the back end going out of this thing especially in this weather and even in wet mode <laughs> You don't feel like it's unsecure, obviously, because you always feel like you know exactly what's happening. But you do have to be a bit careful. Mega fun, though. So much fun. There is nothing like driving a Porsche 911. The engine is brilliant, right? Loads of character. It's noisy and it like dominates the experience. It's really gravelly. It's really unique in the way that it sounds. <laughs> And it revs more freely into a higher limiter than a six cylinder turbo engine really has any right to. And yet because it's a turbo engine, it's got loads of torque low ends. So you just have an engine that feels relentless across the spread of the rev range. You don't have to thrash it for it to feel quick, but if you do thrash it, it feels mental. <laughs> So the standard Carrera has this engine too, but the S-Bit adds more power and significantly more torque. It comes as standard with an eight-speed PDK automatic, although Porsche is probably gonna stick a seven-speed manual on the options list soon, if you wanna be all purist and porsche about your 911 experience. Did a Porsche throw up on you? <laughs> hey, let's push up! You can already get the manual in America.
Personally, I wouldn't bother. I think this gearbox is fantastic. Bit jerky at lower speeds, arguably, slightly, if you wanted to be picky about it. But just so good at doing the quick stuff, so snappy and so good at being in the right gear at the right time. Like the gear that you're thinking about, you know? It'll change down two or three ratios like that, so you can forgive it, maybe it's a tiny bit of low speed harshness. And that really just lets you concentrate fully on steering the car, which is the best thing about this. It seems like an obvious thing to say, but because there is nothing quite like the feel of a 911, still despite what I said before I think you want to be concentrating on that you want to be concentrating on the feel of turning it and the weight transfer and the power that it has and the noise the way I see it right when it's done properly automatics in this sort of car are always the way to go now I do have one problem with this gearbox though and it's the tiny little gear selector it's less a gear knob and more a gear nubbin anything in a car or in anything that you can call a nubbin is probably something that you don't want to have <laughs> Kind of reminds me of that bit in The Hangover. If I do find the clip, I'll play it for you. But you have been warned. <laughs> yeah, I found the clip. There's a worm. It's a mushroom. Wait a second. Is that? Nubbins aside, everything else that you touch in this car is top notch and not at all creepy. Which brings us to the next and most major, arguably, improvement over the last 911, the interior. Porsche's finally worked out that a load of buttons do not a neat nor modern cabin make. So now you only get like this row of toggles and some lovely screens, both in the dash and in front of you. What can I say, right? The quality is rock solid, the infotainment is really intuitive, the screen looks really nice, dead clear, and of course this car is ergonomically perfect. If you'd like a lesson in how a sports car should sit you down behind the wheel, sit yourself down in a 911. And it's that feeling, that feeling of being hunkered down, being part of the machine, part of the mechanism, that makes the 911 great, makes it special. Other cars do that and do it really well, but nothing does it quite like a 911. So whether you're driving it fast on a B road or slow on the way to work or whatever, you always feel like you're part of a piece of automotive art, a bit of engineering science. It's just everything, the weight of the steer and the heft of it, and actually even the steering wheel itself, you know, it's on this like really vertical plane pointing right at you like a race car steering wheel and the way it moves over the road is really unique to a 911 there is still just something magic about this car there is something built into it that is almost inexplicable but you just sort of fall in love with and what's so impressive is that it feels that way it feels like a natural driving experience despite the fact that it's had more work done than Caitlyn Jenner so this car's got chassis control it's got four-wheel drive obviously it's got rear wheel steering it's got ceramic brakes but you would say that they all add something to the driving experience. Sharper turning, more cornering feel, fade free stopping power, some comfort sometimes. Although on that, right, this is not a comfortable car. It's a manageable car, but it's not comfortable. So you can soften the suspension down and it is quite settled on the motorway and you can fit into it properly, obviously, and that's great driving position, which is a big part of comfort, of course, not just about having soft suspension, but it is really noisy. Like you get on the motorway and all you can hear is wind and the tires are massively noisy. And that is the thing because I actually think that the R8, for example, does that day-to-day -day stuff much better than this. It feels much quieter on the motorway. The damping feels, dare I say, that bit more sophisticated in the R8. It's much better at ameliorating the body movement. But hi, no big deal. These cars are what they are, and this has got rear seats. What you didn't see was that Big Bear had basically ingested his legs. There is nothing behind here. Oh well. And so now we come to the bit where I draw a conclusion and I tell you whether I think you should put your money into this car as if my opinion really matters. The thing about a 911 though is that it sort of transcends all that stuff. The 911 is a dream car for generations of people. It's a car wrapped up in formative experiences, literally the shape of success. A car that a lot of people feel like they have to do at some point in their lives to prove that life's gone all right for them. My dad bought one of these a few years ago because he'd always promised himself one during times when maybe life was a bit more of a struggle. He bought it, he enjoyed that feeling of hard-earned accomplishment for a bit, and then he got rid of it after about a year when it broke in spectacular and very expensive fashion. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, on that, and this is anecdotal, right, but in the journalistic spirit of reporting things as you find them, this particular car has developed two faults in the time that I've had it, a week. So actually right now it's telling me that there's an ignition lock fault and there's an inspection necessary, which it's been telling me for most of the week. And also the electronic parking brake just seems to work when it wants to. I have to tell you that because I would be foaming if this was my 126,000 pound car with 11 and a half thousand miles on the clock. So yeah, would I buy one? Of course I would. It's a 911 and it's one of the best driving experiences you can have. But to be honest with you, I'm still in the camp that thinks that the biggest problem that this car has is parked right next to it in the Porsche dealership. Why would you not just buy a Cayman GTS? It gives you virtually all of the same excitement and Porsche-ness, albeit with just the two seats, and it does it for half the price. Honestly, I would do that. So there you go, Porsche 911. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Please give us your thoughts below, no matter how good, bad, indifferent, or just plain demented. We enjoy them all. Thanks for your support, and I'll see you soon. Cheers. Bye. This isn't the weirdest thing I've ever done. <sighs> Seatbelt on, big bear. Safety first. <laughs> Oh no, Big Bear's neck's not strong enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, time to go Big Bear.